What exactly that? According to me, um, really, it's based on um, an experience in Argentina. It's a word that's an experience. It's a relationship. And I first heard it and learned about it um, in Argentina after 2001, after the economic collapse, and then mass popular organizing um, that took place throughout the entire country of Argentina. Um, and I first heard this word horizontalidad there and thought, oh, wow, that's really, you know, kind of interesting, exciting, what is it? And would ask people. Um, and people would always, first thing they would do is say, horizontalidad, it's this. Um, and I said, well, what, what is that? Well, it's not this. Um, and it was a description of a relationship people were creating um, and attempting to create. So to ask people in Argentina, they would say um, it's kind of a tool to get to a certain kind of relationship. So you use forms of horizontal relating, direct communication, face-to-face, um, -face, respecting um, the other person and difference, so as to create a more horizontal space. So it's kind of a tool and a goal in a lot of ways. And so I've adopted that idea as far as what is horizontalidad, and then horizontalism is a bit of a bad translation of horizontalidad, because it's not an ism, but it's more than horizontality, I think, which is more of a description, because it is this relationship, um, and it's an ever-changing kind of relationship, so it needs to be dynamic. So that, kind of just in the basics, from there, since the experience in Argentina, a lot of people around the world have been using the language of horizontal to describe movements, um, and to describe, often to describe these relationships that we're trying to create, I think sometimes, though, it's also used um, the goal part of it and not the process part. So we would like to be horizontal, but then people say we are, um, without actually going through the process of creating the relationships. So it's, it's a tricky um, concept, I think, as it's used sometimes now, because it can be used more like an ideology rather than a process and a practice, which is what it really is um, at its heart. The necessity of the horizontalidad, I mean, I think a lot of things arise from necessity in the new movements that we're looking at now, and the new movements meaning going back to Argentina and even the Zapatistas, but um, necessity is both survival necessity, so questions in Argentina was economic crisis, it was people coming together to, to find ways to survive, but also the necessity to be heard and to be with one another, so it's not just needing to survive, but needing to be acknowledged and seen in a society where you've been completely shut out. And that's part of where the crisis comes from. So there's kind of these multiple levels of necessity, and this horizontal relationship comes out of both needing to be heard with one another and needing to construct concretely something different. The politics of kind of necessity, I think we're seeing more and more around the world, and that we have to do that ourselves. That's also the, the self-organization, you know, in Spanish people say autogestion, which is self-organization, but also with this kind of implied horizontality, horizontalism, um, and that's having to do it, yeah, with, with one another, because the state's not gonna do it, governments aren't gonna do it, institutions of power aren't gonna do it. Um, and then out of that, Emilio in the book is talking about necessity um, and tools of freedom and going beyond um, institutions of power, and there's more of an ideology there that we need to construct a whole different kind of society. Um, but the first step is just surviving and figuring out ways together to do that. Hmm. Um, the, the construction of horizontal relationships is about not looking at difference, but it's also not about trying to create sameness either. So it is a kind of seeing that people are different and acknowledging that, but working together as a kind of collective whole. So acknowledging that we all come from different places of power, of identity, um, and then working together in as flat a way as possible and as equal a way. Um, as possible. So not homogenizing at all in a sameness sense, but being able to all be in the same space and acknowledging these differences. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, this is seen in identity questions, in 
what I would call class questions, which weren't necessarily addressed in that same way in Argentina, but with unemployed and people who had considered themselves middle class collaborating in a way that they never had before, but without necessarily having the discussion of how do we unlearn our class issues. It wasn't. It's being in that same assembly and the form of relating that, that creates this new relationship. Um, and that's true class, gender, race, um, which is not talked about in, in Argentina so much, but there's a lot of people coming from Mapuche and Guarani backgrounds, and that is definitely racialized, and people who, you know, who are darker skinned are more um, poor. And so that also creating this space where all people were functioning um, more on a flat plane. So this is Claudia, um, who is a very good friend of mine as well, over the years became a very good friend of mine. Um, and this idea of organizing, coming together in a very natural way, that it is natural for us to listen to one another, to acknowledge one another, to take turns. And she references how children play together. Um, and it's really true. It is not natural in any sense to all of a sudden assign roles of you're in charge and this person has this you know, powerful role and this one doesn't. It's when we come together, and we come together with friends or children come together, we, people figure out what we're gonna do, you know, even in social settings, whatever settings, what are we gonna eat for dinner? Mm -hmm. We don't assign someone to decide what everyone's gonna eat, whether they like it or not. We decide what works for everyone. If you're a vegetarian, if you don't like zucchini, whatever. It's you know, how we make decisions. And, and that is just the most natural way to, to be. And if we think about our lives, that's how they function generally, how we function um, generally, how children function generally. And then later, it's we're taught these other ways of being, to have power over, to have verticality. All of that hierarchy is, is taught and kind of, not just ingrained in our life, but kind of we're hit over the head with it until finally we comply with it. Children in school, the education system is a very good example of really forcing children to learn this kind of power over and hierarchy, which most naturally rebel against, which is quite healthy. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. It's beautiful. Um, that the idea, I mean, when people start to talk about creating spaces where you're just dreaming, where you're free, where you can create, where there's the production of, you know, alternative desires and really just exploring ourselves and our deepest creativity and desires is a, is a place where a movement has evolved in a certain way, I think, that relationships have developed enough so that people can start to imagine in this way. Um, so this is a conversation actually that was taking place in Argentina. And it was after a few years of creating specific kinds of relationships so that people were creating alternatives and ways of being and creating alternatives and ways of relating. And that process freed people's imaginations to go beyond just thinking about, and it's not to minimalize, but not just thinking about how we're going to have the most democratic conversation or how we're going to make sure people have food but to then think about okay well what what else is there besides our material needs and besides having democratic non non-hierarchical um, conversations and relationships then what and then the territory shifts into a discussion of art and culture and desire and just imagining all these things differently and anew and it's a really beautiful place when we can start to imagine, it's really imagining a different world that would be our world, that we create fresh. Yeah, it's really interesting because it was very early on um, when uh, people in the movements in Argentina were still just kind of figuring out what is horizontalidad and then reflecting on what is this process that they were creating and that they named there. You know, there wasn't a name for it before in, in Spanish or in English. Um, but then to warn very early that it could become an ideology was an important warning. And it happened to some extent in Argentina, but I think 
it is happening more and more around the world. It's something that people, you know, in our global movements in Occupy in New York, for example, um, learned about the experience in Argentina, heard about it, and thought, oh, we, we want to be that. So it comes from a good place. You know, we want to be horizontal. We want these relationships. But saying you are something doesn't make you that thing. Saying you have a relationship doesn't make that relationship. So there was this error in kind of jumping to we are horizontal without going through the process of really doing the work to create and pay attention. I mean, we did a very good job in creating relationships, but we kind of jumped a little bit. Um, the other danger in this kind of making it more of an ideology or a thing rather than a process um, is making it almost a hierarchy of who's more horizontal. And so there, you know, we've seen in some of our movements, I think now, um, and I'm meaning everything from Occupy to the 15M or different movements around the world, a sense of, you know, well, we're more horizontal. You know, we've broken down hierarchy more than you. Um, and, and that's creating its own kind of power and hierarchy in that comparison. And so it's, again, not focusing on the relationship and the development and the process itself and focusing on it as if it's a, a thing. This, this place, there's a building that was taken over, a huge building next to a train station in Lomas de Zamora, a really poor area, out on the outskirts of Buenos Aires. And people in the community took it over to make it a community center. And it's just this massive cement building that a few different assemblies came together, neighborhood assemblies and an unemployed group, to take over the building and, and room by room reconstruct it and make it useful for the community. And they had to build trust among one another to do that. So the fear um, that a lot of people talk about breaking with is I think it's a multi-layered fear that people are talking about. It's a fear just of being able to do anything in society. I'm um, just being afraid to, not fear that someone will hurt you, but, but a fear of, of doing, of acting, of organizing in, in just your own agency. Um, there's that kind of level of fear, I think, that people just don't do it. Um, and then there's a fear, again, it's not a fear that someone's going to hurt you, but a kind of fear of one another, not having trust in one another, and I think it's breaking down that, that kind of fear um, that maybe someone will ridicule you, maybe you won't be accepted, um, so it's a kind of personal, emotional fear that I think is also broken down. And then the, the contrast to it is the trust that's built. So, so many people in movements going back to Argentina, but also in the movements now talk about trust, care, and in Argentina in particular, they talk about love and afectividad, so affect with an A, um, and how the importance of that emotion in the construction of new relationships. So it's breaking with the fear, but to break that fear, it's not just having horizontal relationships, we have to be creating something else with one another. And so it's creating a trust through care, and that happens in practice in what we do to take care of each other, but it happens also in just the nature of active listening and paying attention to the person, all of us, who've been excluded and ignored by all institutions pretty much always, um, so that it's breaking down the fear and creating something different in that space. We need a territory, but this is then where the question of territory and space aren't necessarily the same. That I believe in the construction of territory in actual physical space, but I also think we can create relationships. I think it's best in physical space, but I think we can create relationships um, that have to happen in person, and we create a space in that personal relationship, but I don't think that has to be a park or a building or a square. Um, I think we can create these relationships with one another without being in a, the same physical space. But there needs to be the physicality, there needs to be the, the relationship and a regular relationship with one another to be able to do that. So I think we can create those relationships. I think the, it relating to something concrete 
is what's really important. Um, and that we have, you know, when the assemblies take place all over the world, you see people standing in a circle. And that circle to me is the construction of a territory. So it happened that in the Occupy movements in Gezi Park and, and 15M, that we were in parks and plazas that we occupied. Um, but we all were standing pretty much always in circles to have the conversations to look at one another. And I think that, that we're constructing a kind of space with one another is what's important. Um, ideally, we're in a physical space. But to be deprived of that space doesn't mean we can't have our construction anymore. We can't. I think we just need to think in terms of what are we constructing with these new relationships. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. That 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 Gezi Park, Occupy, these were all moments and they were a lot of people in the movements themselves talked about waking up or sparks and things like that. And these were these sparks um, where our imaginations opened and kind of it began. And we began to imagine together and to dream together and organize together. Taking away the space in so many places was incredibly depressing. And there was physical violence and there was a lot everyone um, was and continues to go through. Having gone through these experiences, many people never having experienced brutality like that. Um, but, but the dreaming together, the thinking together, the imagining together, that remains. People changed as people. We did it individually and we did it collectively and there's that kind of dynamic of individual and collective um, changing and thinking and imagining that happens. And so that not only has continued, but I do think it is more solid I think in a lot of places, though, people are trying to figure out um, where to put that energy, that dream, that emotion now. People are involved in different movements and in different places, but it's still figuring it out. But it is, it's a process. It hasn't been very long. In Argentina, it's interesting on this topic that they, people in the movements now, who are people who are just getting involved, so we're talking, you know, almost 15 years later, using the same forms of organization, horizontalidad, effective politics, self-organization, refer to what happened on the 19th and 20th, the banging of the pots and pans and the forcing out of the governments, as, um, well, they talk about that as a kind of moment, as a break. And then they talk about what they're doing now as being the children of, they say we're hijos of the 19th and 20th. We're children of kind of those days and those new relationships. And I think that's a really interesting and useful way to think about us as far as relationship to Occupy and Gessi and, and um, Plaza del Sol and the different Saint Dagma places around the world, um, is that we are continuing to organize and think and imagine in a way kind of that we learned there, we were marked from that. So whether we're children of it, or in Spain, they talk about the DNA that came from Sol and 15M. So it kind of, it's in us, in our way of relating. Um, and I think that's a really helpful way to think about it as well. Yeah, it's relational. It has to be relational, all of this. In that relationship, in building a trust, you as an individual do feel more secure or held and supported. And so there would, of course, be concepts of self-confidence. It's not a word that I've heard used probably at all by anyone in movements. People talk about trust. Sometimes people talk about feeling like subjects or actors. I mean, this has been true for years in different movements around the world. It's a very similar language people are using. And, and a kind of agency, that's my word, but a kind of agency people are feeling in this. But it's more coming out of the relationship, most people talk, yeah, about trust and care as a base. It's a great question. Visually, it really is how, when I saw the first visual of Gessie Park, I knew this was a movement like the 15M in Spain, like Occupy, and you could tell by looking, I don't speak Turkish. I didn't see subtitles to the conversations, but the the organization of the space, the way people were facing one another, the way people 
you could, I, I first saw an assembly, um, and you can see, you could see how people were actively listening to each other, how something was being facilitated. There's just, it was a dynamic and an energy. It wasn't like a meeting, it was watching an assembly and watching people's faces kind of like light up in the same way. I don't, I don't want to sound kind of esoteric in this, but it was a feeling. It was like, I feel this is the same kind of phenomenon that I've seen in all of these different places in Greece and Spain and the US and Portugal around the world, that it was a very, the, the use of the space for the relationship, the actual looking at the people and looking at their faces in that space. They were constructing something so similar. Yeah, that's, I don't know how else to describe it, but it was a feeling when I saw it, like, yes, they are us, we are them, I, I know that, I'm, I'm there. It was, it's really emotional, it's pretty incredible to go through this and see, like, what has now become millions of people organizing in a way that's so similar and so beautiful because it's so respectful of the other and we don't see that in society, we don't get to do this in society, we don't have relationships where you meet someone and you start to really try to listen and have people help so we can listen to one another and respect each other and and then try to do things to make our lives better collectively. Yeah. Well, of course. I mean, that the the way that mainstream media covered everything that was going on was as much as possible to isolate each as its own little pocket, having its own specific, you know, what happened in Hong Kong was about Hong Kong and China, right? And to try to put everything into a little category rather than, or its own little box separate, rather than this is a global phenomenon and that there is something taking place that people are both responding to and resisting and then creating in that space of resistance in the same way all over the world. That the mainstream media reflected all of that, then, I think the movements would have felt that that much even that much more. Um, not that the mainstream media helps movements really, but sometimes seeing yourself reflected in the mainstream media can give an extra boost um, mm. to movements, and it definitely would have I think isolated less um, the Middle East and allowed those movements to flourish more. I think the mainstream media played a big role in isolating those movements, not covering the fact that there was intervention by all kinds of whether other governments, um, NGOs that were involved in disrupting the movements and not allowing them to flourish. There was a serious campaign actually to isolate um, and keep it from going as global. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, for making important decisions you have to have smaller groups of people It also then people hold one another accountable because it's a smaller group so it's much easier to tell that person okay whoever you are Michelle you're going on and on and on you can't do that and there's an accountability because a trust has been built with each other um, to not do that to not take each other's space so I think smaller groups there's so many reasons why ultimately we should be in smaller groups I think it was very important though for all of the movements to see one another in our massivity, <laughs> to see the thousand, two thousand, three thousand. The people's mic in New York was completely unwieldy, um, and the people adopted it around the world when they actually could use microphones and could use amplifying sound. Um, but it was to hear one another's voice. That was the part that was so important to hear our own voices in the beginning by the thousands. That was central. After that, absolutely moving into smaller groups. Um, is really the only way I also believe that we can make really concrete decisions together because of the question of time, because of the questions of trust, um, and to be more locational so that people who know one another because we live in the same neighborhood or we work in the same place or we our children go to the same school, that there's some kind of commonality bringing us together rather than we take subways to it or buses or bicycle to a park. Um, that. That works for some moments, but in the longer term, in a vision of creating a whole new society, it has to be more specific and locational, for sure. Utopia is a, it's, a, an, imag it's a, an imaginary thing. It's a dream. It's a, it's a place, a thing we want to construct. Um, 
a place we want to be, but it's not an actual real place, I think, that we can be. Um, I do like the Galeano's spin on the Argentine directors, the, the idea of utopias, you know, that you walk two steps closer and then it moves two steps further and you walk closer and it moves further, that it's, you know, it's about the walk, it's about the path. And, and I have a similar sense of utopia. It's somewhere, it's a, um, a way of relating and being in a society where we can really hear one another and be ourselves and, and learn to be different selves by relating in different ways with each other and creating a kind of base of, of freedom and emancipation where that can happen. Um, of course, there's all kinds of concrete, you know, we can't have capitalism, we can't have hierarchy. I mean, there are all of these many concrete things that would be necessary in a utopian space. Um, but the relationships part is really important in that, and that's partly why it keeps moving, is because as we construct a more free society and these horizontal relationships, we become different people, and we create a new space, a new territory, if you will, and then that changes as we continue to change, so it has to be dynamic, and so we start to construct something, and then we learn in that process that there's so much more involved in being free or creating freedom. And we have to then continue to relate and build the relationships to continue to try to create it. So it's a, it's a very hard question, though. But it's a wonderful question. And it's one we should ask all the time. We set our sights way too low and small sometimes. Even in thinking about, do we need to transform society? That, that question is too small. Um, it needs to be, I like that utopia, expanding it to everything. Utopia would redefine territory. I don't know how to answer the question because we need territory. We need to construct new territories, um, and that is, you know, what people have been doing, and I think that's what we're going to continue to do in this kind of path towards utopia. Um, but then, maybe we won't need to construct territory. Maybe it'll mean something very different. Um, so the way we understand the construction of something in space now. Once we have more freedom to be and to relate, the concept of space, I think, will be different, and the concept of territory will have to be different. So I can't imagine what that's going to be, except to know that it's dynamic and it will be changing. Yeah? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> Thank it's you. A, through this process of creating new relationships and the assemblies and developing this trust, they're thinking about alternative ways of surviving then. So the whole question of sustainability isn't just about will the land be sustainable, but how do we as families survive? If we're not working for the mining company, what do we do? Um, okay, well, we got the 11 minutes. <laughs> and that was new. I don't know that's, who's, yeah, who's beep, beep.